Hello everybody at Fastem. My name is Richard Brown. I'm here from the OpenSUSE project to talk to you about OpenSUSE MicroOS. First, a little bit about myself. I've been an OpenSUSE contributor since the project began. I've been working at SUSE now since 2013. I'm a really passionate advocate of rolling releases. In the past, I used to be a QA engineer. These days, I'm a Linux distribution engineer in SUSE's future technology team. And I'm working mostly on, on two different rolling distributions, microOS and Cubic, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. And in my spare time, I'm a rather avid photographer. So when it comes to talking about what is microOS, I actually find it easier to ask the question, why is microOS? And as a team, we've been looking at sort of the way the world works these days. And even though Linux distributions are typically doing the same thing they have been doing for the last 20, 30 years, Computers aren't the same as they have been for the last 20, 30 years. They're not just laptops, desktops, and servers anymore. And even when they are your traditional laptop, desktop, or servers, people aren't using them the same way as they used to. Kind of starting with an example of, you know, what isn't a traditional device. You know, if you think of these IP webcams, these are small, what they say, IoT devices, but they are in practice a small microcomputer. And this computer as firmware and an operating system, and then people realize they've never actually updated it. There are millions of these devices out there. They've all quite often got malware or are susceptible to being contributing to things like malware bots and botnets. But quite often manufacturers are very, very nervous about updating them because a failed update is gonna cause many, many unhappy customers. This isn't just a problem in like the tradition, in the tiny sort of IoT devices space, in sort of the bigger, more, widespread embedded world you know you have examples like this with o2 in the uk where they have their entire network of devices across the entire country all doing their cell phone towers where so it's what your phone connects to to get its network access and in the 2019 they rolled out an update to all of these devices and that update effectively bricked every single one of their cell phone towers and also broke the recovery mechanism for a, a failed firmware update. So the only way of fixing the issue was like literally sending engineers out to every single cell phone tower in the country. Meanwhile, no one can get any cell phone access, no data, no 4G. Repair took a really, really long time and it really kind of stressed the need for being able to have update mechanisms where sort of rollback and, and sort of easy recovery were like absolutely key part. Another kind of more esoteric example of what you could say is IoT or Edge is you know, something like this Vectron Siemens train, you know, which in reality is kind of 300 device rolling data center. You're talking about a, a train that has 300 different sensors, all needing to be available pretty much all of the time. You've got hundreds of these cars out there, billions of bits of data, you know, literally terabytes of data all needing to be processed. And, you know, no, <laughs> yeah, no cellular uplink is going to be a sensible way of uploading this data all of the time. So quite often this data has to be locally analyzed, locally processed. So you effectively have a full blown data center moving around this country on a train the whole time. And then they need to be able to be updated via these slow remote links and then be able to, when they're back in the depot, when they're able to have a decent internet connection, then send their pre-processed data up to some big data cloud for actual proper deeper analysis. And of course, another example is sort of this sort of really big cluster uh, example of, you know, not just a few machines where you can quite easily micromanage them sort of the very, if, with sort of the traditional sort of pet cattle analogy. You know, these aren't machines which are going to be cared for, micromanaged or micromanageable. You're talking about hundreds of machines, far too many for any one person or even a team to easily look after. They all need to be the same operating system version. You're only talking about some kind of workload orchestration on these clusters, such as Kubernetes. And the need really strikes home with that when you've got these hundreds or thousands of machines to have automatic update, automatic rollback. And if there is any kind of mach uh, problem machine, it's far more likely that that machine is going to be killed and then replaced rather than, you know, carefully, lovingly brought back to attention 
and brought back to regular working behavior. So, you know, the teams, my team's been kind of looking at this and realizing that, you know, in many respects, we're living in a new world you know, where the cloud is ambiguous. Everybody has cloud options now. They might not all be using it, but if you need more hardware you know, on the cloud, you know, a few more machines is just a credit card away. You've got all of these IoT devices out there, all with single purpose, all needing to have some way of being updated. Even in sort of the traditional data center, you know, virtualization is endemic. You know, there's more services running in more VMs, not and when customers or users need to add more services, you don't necessarily just add more machines to their networks. They can add more VMs to their existing infrastructure that they have. And you have, of course, containers, which helps this sort of grease the wheels of this new world where you've got, you know, the sandboxing, limiting incompatibilities and isolating service problems. So if something does go wrong, it doesn't necessarily impact the entire system or bring down other services that are unrelated to the container or containers that are misbehaving. Outside of the data center and server worlds, you know, I've also been looking at this from sort of the desktop side. And if you look at the education uh, industry, which I used to work in before I got into all this IT stuff, then you'll see that, you know, in the US at least, you know, the standard desktop is more and more disappearing or in many of it's gone and the kind of main teaching aid are these chrome os netbooks you know basically desktop appliances with all the applications being nice simple lightweight apps they're easier to manage they're easier for for less and less less it literate staff to help manage for you so you don't need to have a complicated it department looking after it and okay, that's in the US, which might not necessarily be a perfect example of the entire world. But if you look at the rest of the world outside the US, you'll see over the last years, this trend is starting to grow there as well, where even Windows and Mac and even Linux are getting sort of pushed out of the education industry. And Chrome OS is typically becoming more becoming the first experience that students have in the classroom. Um, and so when you're thinking about, you know, what should be the first or what should be you know, the root for desktop Linux makes me start wondering, you know, maybe the root needs to be more aligned with what Chrome and Chrome OS are doing in the same way that we used to align desktop Linux to kind of poach Windows users. Maybe we need to start thinking about, you know, Chrome OS to be a sort of easy on-ramp for people who basically learned Chrome OS in school as they've been growing up. Regardless, if these machines are end user devices or running in a data center, there are some pretty common requirements that run through despite these very different use cases you know these operating systems need to be very small the users don't want to necessarily micromanage these machines in the same way they've been traditionally doing so but the smaller the machine the less there is to change the less there is to manage the less updates they also is a very common need for a very predictable operating system you know it needs to work in exactly the way it's expected to once it's working in that way it needs to stay that way and not change its behavior unexpectedly. It needs to obviously be reliable and work. In all of these requirements, you're talking very much of, of appliances or single purpose machines. So not everybody is going to have the same requirements, exactly the same set of examples. So having automatic personalization, so it's very easy for a different school or different company or you know, a different manufacturer embedding this into their devices, be able to personalize it specifically for their use case. Like I discussed with the, like the O2 examples and the IoT examples, you know, any kind of failure of updating needs to be able to automatically roll back. There's lots of places, especially in the IoT world, where real time is a hard requirement. And in, in almost all these cases, we're talking about having containers or some kind of containerized framework being sort of the first class workload, if not the sole workload running on top of this operating system. And with these requirements, with these examples, with these use cases, you know, regular Linux just isn't good enough anymore. And it breaks my heart to say that as a long-term OpenSUSE user, but, you know, regular distributions are like Swiss Army knives. There's a ton of services, a ton of features, but those tons of services and features end up being the biggest problem. There's always an increased chance that they're gonna be incompatible or adding some new service breaks some other service. <laughs> 
And, you know, I've had plenty of cases where even really well-managed machines, you know, have an issue on service A, which then kind of cause a cascading failure with different services, B, C, D, E, et cetera. And it can be a real nightmare digging down, figuring out the root cause, analyzing that, and then bringing the system back up and running. And these are all kind of ways of living that just don't really fit with the sort of new world order of embedded devices, single purpose devices, and, and appliance desktops. You see this today in the data center with VMs. You know, you don't have a situation where you, like you would traditionally, where you install a server and then you put on your mail server, your DNS server, and some identity system all on the same machine. Typically, even in the most sort of basic server environment, you're dealing in VMs where you'd have a single VM for your DNS, a single VM for your mail, and a single VM for your identity management. And these installations are all going to try and individually have as little uh, variation between them, but also have as minimal number of services between them. Quite often, unfortunately, it's patching gets ignored. You know, it's easier quite sometimes to rip and replace these VMs and actually update them. But when you do see these sort of single purpose VMs being used, you know, if someone needs to add more services, they don't go into an existing VM and modify it. They're typically just adding more VMs or in the cloud, you know, adding more cloud installations or potentially IoT devices. So this concept of single purpose systems isn't that new, but on the flip side, there aren't really many operating systems or Linux distributions out there that are kind of focused on maximizing and optimizing for this way of working. And whereas at the moment, though, people are quite often taking traditional distributions and handcrafting them, building these single purpose custom installations, quite often having lots of issues with configuration management, having quite a lot of issues with keeping them patched, and optimizing these instances for sort of minimal RAM usage, minimal CPU usage, minimal disk usage is incredibly hard work. And nobody is perfect, and especially no sysadmin is perfect, speaking as a former sysadmin. Even the best designed and maintained systems have flaws and will fail. These flaws need to be prevented. And they need to, at least, if not be totally prevented, at least be mitigated so they don't get in the way of what the system is meant to be doing. And in my team, this has kind of brought this philosophy of like anything that's worth doing is worth undoing. You know, no issue just appears out of nowhere. So if you're able to do something on a system, there's always a chance that change might be wrong. So there needs to be some way of undoing every single change you make to a running system. And this is really where MicroOS comes in. As a, an OpenSUSE variant that's really designed to address this whole collection of issues, requirements, and this new philosophy of single purpose systems. It's predictable in that yeah, every single time you're installing MicroOS, it's going to behave the same way. It's going to be updated in a very predictable fashion and be predict and only be updated in a, in a mutable fashion. Once it's deployed, it's not going to change without you actively changing. And if you do make that change, it'll be done in a predictable and rollbackable way. These updates will be rel are reliable with automatic updates and automatic recovery, automatic rollback of any failed updates. And we keep MicroOS as small as it can be to do that one job it needs to do. Generally speaking, this means having a very minimal operating system with some kind of container runtime or some containerized framework, depending on the use case, and then having all the applications and the, all the services actually running containerized or sandboxed. From an architecture perspective, MicroOS is just built as a variant of OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. So the main Tumbleweed rolling release, always releasing the latest stuff, or Tumbleweed gets built consistently in the OpenSUSE build surface. So that's part of the reliability story there. It's all reproducibly built. It also gets tested in the OpenSUSE OpenQA. And in the case of MicroOS, we link all this together. So it gets built together with the rest of Tumbleweed. It gets tested together with the rest of Tumbleweed. And then any build or test failure in either Tumbleweed or MicroOS actually prevents the release of, of either distribution. So you can really see that they're kind of tied together at the hip. The operating system that's released right now is pretty small. So a typical micro OS installation on bare metal is going to be about 619 megabytes. Most of that because of the kernel, because we need the kernel there for all the bare metal <laughs> hardware drivers. Um, if you get rid of that and want to optimize it away and just have micro OS for a VM image, you're talking more about 380 megabytes. 
because we're using a much more optimized kernel default base package. There isn't any firmware options there, of course, um, but yeah, much smaller, much lighter, and we're always looking at ways of optimizing it and shrinking it down even further than that. As a sysadmin, I used to always think, you know, once I've deployed something, I never want to touch it again. You know, patching it's always going to be dangerous. I don't really want to risk it if I don't have to. Um, so yeah, it, it, this is a mantra that's very true, but at the same time, you know, we, we still have to update systems. There's still always security issues. There's still always functionality updates we need. With this OpenSUSE microOS, we have a transactional update stack. So any change to the system, can only happen because by default microOS is actually set out as read only. So the updates can only happen via this mechanism, which is always done reliably, always done reproducibly, and always done reversibly. This entire process is atomic, so it either entirely happens or nothing happens at all. You don't get sort of a partial update of a system, it's yeah, everything or nothing. And the way we apply it, it is done in a way that applies without impacting the running system in any way, manner, or form. Literally, the sort of the file management parts, the patching, all happens in a separate change route or in a separate PTFS subvolume. Nothing of nothing in the original in the current running file system gets impacted, and then you flip to that new file system in a single atomic operation. From a user's perspective, therefore, the file system ends up looking like this: you have a a BTFS subvolume basically containing your root file system, BTFS snapshot. This is read-only. You're currently booted to the one called current root, and there'll be the historical previous ones in this case, or previous versions of previous microOS installations. When the system wants to be updated, or the, you know, the users either triggered it, or more realistically, the system D service is triggering it as part of an automated process, that current root file system is going to be cloned as a snapshot process in BTFS. That clone gets turned to read-write. So again, nothing changed in the running system, but that read-write, the read-only clone gets changed to a read-write clone. That then gets updated using your typical zip or up or zip adup process. That then gets changed back to read-only. So all those changes are encapsulated in one single process. And that new snapshot gets marked as the next boot target. So your atomic operation for activating that new file system is reboot, which also has the convenience side effect of also meaning all your processes are shut down. So there's no nasty side effect of running process, you know, suddenly finding its binaries are swapped out or its database is incompatible or you know, something nasty like that. Then after rebooting, you get that new snapshot as your current root file system. If you don't reboot and you just keep on doing updating, only that last version takes effect because we don't necessarily know if the previous one sort of in also taken after the current boot but before the next boot are actually any good so in transactional update now we actually have some capability of continuing a snapshot so you can have one update and then continue it at a second update or more realistically if you're just scripting this as a standard system upgrade you will have two discarded system upgrades you never used and never patched and never tested. And in fact, on the next reboot, they can get thrown away because we know they're not any good or we don't know if they're any good or not more accurately. And then you boot into the current new latest last root file system with your last version. All of this is powered by BTRFS. One of the reasons why we went down this route is because it is incredibly space efficient. Each of these snapshots only contains the diffs. It's not like a you know, USR AB partition where you've got multiple versions of everything all being stacked up. It also means we can cover things like the configuration in ETC. So we're not just rolling back the binaries to the version they used to be, but also rolling the configuration back to the version they used to be. There's no new packaging format required. So we're not doing anything with like RPMS, part of PMOS tree and having to repackage everything into this new format. There's no size limitations for partitions or operating systems. It's, it's really easily enhanceable. You know, we can keep on changing this and we have with adding new functionality for handling ET things like ETC better, potentially handling other sub volumes. And it's incredibly reliable you know, because even if like the entire boot configuration gets messed up or the entire boot configuration is still in a previous snapshot. So all we really need is the smallest modification to grub to give you a grub menu of all the previous snapshots. And basically as long as that patch and that configuration file is working, 
nothing can prevent this system from being bootable. You don't need to have a customized init RD, you don't need to have a customized kernel. It's yeah, just a very small change to the bootloader, which keeps the threat service down for any sort of boot blocking issues. If anything goes wrong, rolling back is a simple case of throwing away the snapshot that you don't like. You're immediately going to go back to the snapshot that was booted last time. So nothing's changed on disk. This can be done as often as you need. You know, there's, there's sort of no waste or, you know, yeah, no risk involved in it at all. We actually have a process called Health Checker, which does this or can do this as part of sort of built in automation of micro OS. So checking for errors as part of the boot phase. If there is an error with that snapshot, it'll roll back to the last working one. Potentially also health check and even look at the sort of weird transient issues where the snapshot used to work, but then it suddenly started breaking again suddenly, in which case it'll actually try rerouting just like a sysadmin. And if that doesn't work, then actually shut itself down and inform the sysadmin. So, you know, you know, something's gone wrong. One limitation of health check is, of course, it needs access to the hard disk. But of course, if the system doesn't have a hard disk, it's probably not booting anyway. So it's not really that much of a, a massive limitation, but it's those things of like, when is a system worth looking after or trying to recover? If the disk is broken, there's probably not much of a system left to look after. All of this is deployed actually using the traditional OpenSUSE way of doing things. So very secure update mechanism, everything delivered by HTTPS, every package is signed, every repository is signed, so you can't just have an intruder flipping out good new packages with old insecure ones. All of these are verified automatically by the package manager. If there's any any issue with any of that chain of trust, or in fact any dependency issues of like this new package doesn't work with something that's already installed, the system doesn't get updated at all. Um, and even if you try and do an update and then something goes wrong during that update process, be it an issue with the package or you know yeah just something breaking, the entire snapshot gets immediately deleted. So again reliable, reproducible, and always moving from one known state to another known state. Micro S, we are targeting multiple different architectures, basically on ARM AH64. Um, we've got support for both firmware or U-boot with EFI and EFI. On x 64 we support both legacy BIOS and UEFI, including secure boot. And in terms of, of memory requirements, we're really only asking for about 512 megabytes plus the workload. And in terms of disk space, we can boot from as small as four gigabytes. We normally say about 10, be realistic, plus the workload. Um, fours, yeah, well, if you can see, if you do the math, you know, we've only got a 600 meg image for uh, a system that can do uh, booting from bare metal. You know, so that four gigabytes is to kind of give us scope for a bunch of change over time with those snapshots. Um, you know, if you've got a really tiny disk and you really want to squeeze it in on there, of course you can, you're just going to have to be you know, very strict in managing how many previous snapshots you have, for example, probably no more than one, which is a perfectly legitimate configuration. So these kind of, gu these kind of requirements are more like guidelines so people can just deploy it, forget about it. When it comes to ways of deploying it, we've got a whole raft of different ways of installing it. So there are actually DVD and net ISOs like traditional OpenSUSE. So you have a nice customizable installer where you can, it's streamlined compared to traditional OpenSUSE, where you can install it, pick what you want, pick the system role, or tinker and tune, tune with it how you want. We have pre-configured images using Vagrant VM, yeah, various VM platforms, various cloud platforms and Raspberry Pis. All these are ready to use. By default, they're configured without a password, um, but they're configured so they can be easily used with a, pro a process called combustion or ignition, which I'll talk about in a second. Or we have a, a salt-based installer called Yomi, which you can you know, find online on GitHub, um, which basically installs directly using salt stack. So sort of kind of completely serverless, just have a system boot into a, a Yomi boot environment and deploy itself entirely from code deployed in salt. Ignition, you might have heard about previously, it originally came from uh, CoreOS, the pre-Fedora CoreOS, which was kind of designed as a replacement for cloud in it. I'm going to skip over it quickly because personally, I don't like it that much. And instead, I'm going to talk about combustion, which is basically there to do pretty much the same thing. You know, configure the system as part of that first boot, especially for those cloud images. The nice thing with combustion is it runs as part of the initRD but it runs as a basic shell script. So you can pretty much do everything you can write in the shell script. I've, I've wrote a blog post about this. You can find on my website. 
where you know you can add files easily, you can install packages, you can add users, set up devices, repartition the entire system. And then of course you've got that, you know, running off a USB stick or a VM device. So then it's easy to reproduce that across all of your machines. So they're all configured exactly the same way on that first boot. Simple, done, dusted, and then you never have to worry about it again. Once the system's deployed, you know, how are you going to run your services on it? Well, with MicroOS, you could just install a traditional RPM using from that transactional update. You know, I wouldn't recommend that for more than one, sort of one or two RPMs in the kind of that sort of traditional, uh, sort of simple, single use case example. But one perfect, perfect opportunity is, of course, if your MicroOS system has a single use of running containers, then we would really recommend using something like Podman, which is an alternative to Docker for standalone container hosts doesn't have a daemon, supports your standard Docker, OCI containers and pods. That's all the sort of familiar commands of podman pull, podman run. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to know about it. You know, you just pick your containers, have you, yeah. In the case of OpenSUSE, we have a registry. All of these are built in OBS. It's very easy to contribute new containers to our OBS registry if you feel like adding to the ecosystem. They're always rebuilt automatically when any package in the OpenSUSE family be it leap or tumbleweed are then modified you get a fresh container out of it all these images are signed or notarized and for example to the base images are things like tumbleweed and leap which are just a simple podman pull away we also have a debugging tool um, which is really useful even if you're not running micro as a container host you know, because you've got a read-only root file system if you need to debug the system you can't just zip it in foo and Get your debug tools there. So the nice thing with Toolbox is you can just run Toolbox. It downloads this container, runs it as an interactive shell, and then you basically have sort of a tiny sort of VM esque container running on that machine, where you can then install those debugging tools. And the current root file system is mounted in there. It's still read only, so you can't go modifying stuff, you know, untransactionally. But it does mean you can see the system as it's running, interrogate the currently running processes, figure out what's going on install what you need and if you want that can be persistent between uses so on one of your systems you can have the same toolbox over and over again which is really useful if you have a problem with recurring you don't need to always initialize your toolbox from zero all the time in my case i'm using micro s pretty much like all over my life now i've no longer got any traditional open servers at all nothing with open leap my next cloud is a micro s container host running a couple of next cloud containers my blog is another microOS container host running a bunch of Jekyll containers, either as inter, uh, sort of long running processes for things like Nginx or as like cron jobs for Jekyll itself. So it you know downloads from Git, my website builds it and then dumps it onto the system. Also got a uh, rather nice emulation station installation. So I plugged into the back of my TV running retro games and I always have a Minecraft server running all on microOS, all using containers. Um, Probably got more examples too. I, like I say, I don't have a single non micro OS machine server wise in my life anymore. Quite often, when I talk about micro OS, some people get the wrong end of the stick with a few things. So, kind of just to kind of kill that out the way in case you're going down the wrong road, you know, micro OS is not an operating system to run inside containers. It's an operating system to run containers or other workloads on top of. In the case of OpenSUSE, we already have perfectly usable and perfectly small container operating systems. You know, the, the BusyBox container from OpenSUSE is nine megabytes small. It's tiny as heck. And this is perfectly reusable for any project you need. Or the Tumbleweed container, you know, has only 90 megabytes. It's still relatively small. Has everything you need to get your container installed at the service you want job done. Be it with Podman or Docker Build or Builder or Kiwi or whatever you're using to build your containers. Now, alongside OpenSUSE MicroOS, we have a side project called OpenSUSE Quebec, which is a sort of MicroOS derivative focused specifically on containers and more specifically than that, Kubernetes in particular. Like MicroOS, it's built entirely and tested entirely as part of the Tumbleweed release process. But it's really dealing with the issues that you have with Kubernetes. You know, it's a Kubernetes being a framework which is really focused on that example of, sort of the large cluster we were talking about earlier, you know, hundreds or thousands of machines running hundreds or thousands of containers. 
on very large clusters spanning spanning lots of vms potentially spanning also lots of geographies if yeah you know if you've got a very complicated cluster or arrangement of multiple clusters and there is a ton of moving parts you've got the containers themselves you've got kubernetes you've got the container runtime underneath and all of this stuff quite often has to be configured to be in sync with each other you know even though kubernetes runs its container uh even though kubernetes is running its uh container control plane in containers you know they're still dependent on the container runtime below that and the kubelet below that so you know when you suddenly have a situation where you want to update the control plane you still have to worry about making sure the base operating system is updated and actually in the right order because if you update the wrong thing at the wrong time you can't then update the control plane so with cubic we've kind of taken micro os and tuned it with the goal of being sort of the perfect kubernetes operating system it's fully integrated with the upstream kubeadm way of deploying cl clusters currently uses cryo with its container runtime the whole update mechanism is tied and fully integrated with cured the the uh, kubernetes reboot daemon so transactional update can update the nodes tell cured you know this node is ready for a reboot and then the cluster decides okay this node these family of nodes can be rebooted and you know the service is moved away from them etc and we also have a tool called Qubit Control, which basically is a very fancy wrapper around KubeADM, uh, just to streamline a few things if you don't want to do things to the sort of upstream KubeADM way. I've been thinking lately, especially after the acquisition of, of Rancher by Sousa, is uh, things like, you know, is Cubic as we see it right now, actually the perfect Kubernetes operating system? I mean, it, it's certified by the CNCF and it's a perfectly good example. But could we go even better? Um, and kind of ask myself this question of, you know, if Kubernetes has its containerized control plane and Kubernetes knows when it needs to update that and Kubernetes knows what the patch level of the nodes are, why can't we create a version of MicroOS which basically becomes slaved to the, the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster entirely? So actually designed in a way of, instead of having transactional update patching itself, probably removing like the entire transactional update stack as we know it now from the microOS image. So not having any package management native on the system at all, doing the entire thing as BTIFS send and receives from some sort of centrally curated root sub volume image. So I have sort of the cluster knows, okay, this is my golden image. This is the image that I want to have on my nodes. And then using the BTIFS send and receive features to just update all of the nodes with the perfect BTIFS clone of that subvolume. Potentially, you could even distribute that clone as con via containers, um, and then actually have the containers run effectively an equivalent to the transactional update process I've already talked about. So you'd still have subvolumes, you'd still have snapshots, you'd still have the ability to roll everything back, but you wouldn't have any actually binaries on the machine doing it. You just have you know your container deployed and unpack itself in essence. And potentially with BTFS and its, its kind of nice complicated B-tree arrangement, you could uh, find a way, and I've, I've got a proof of concept that kind of works. I'm like using BTFS checksums to verify the entire node root FS. So once one of these upgrades has happened, you know, every node could be checked to make sure that they've all got exactly the same version of exactly the same everything with not a single binary or metadata change across the entire root file system. None of this is certain or solid yet. This is kind of brainstorming, but if you have any uh, any thoughts or ideas on this, please reach out to me because this is kind of a really interesting take on the whole microOS thing. I, I think I can see it really sort of taking Cubic in its own direction, if it works the way it does in my head at least. Another side project of the regular microOS is actually the microOS desktop, where the team asks themselves, you know, what if that one job for microOS, you know, isn't running containers or isn't running some IoT service, but instead was running a desktop, like the Chrome OS example talked about earlier. We have working microOS images now where we basically have a small, tiny base system and then just the desktop environment, in this case, both KDE and GNOME, and the absolute sort of minimum configuration tools, you know, a terminal, a package manager, etc. And then everything else, the browsers, the applications, all the user space stuff is being provided by Flatpaks from Flatup, which you know seems to be a really perfect place for this. You know, upstreams are packaging all of their stuff there. 
why is a distribution do we have to package everything again if everything is already there curated nicely and and nicely sandboxed and easy for us to bolt onto in our own way the micro SD desktop isn't for everybody you know if you already like tumbleweed and leap don't worry they're safe i still use tumbleweed myself although i can see myself moving away from it in time because you know i am a lazy developer and i think this model is actually perfectly perfectly suited for those lazy developers who don't want to tinker with their own machine anymore they just want the desktop that just work and especially if they mostly develop around containers like i am more and more you know i don't really need to mess around with the operating system even when i want to get down and dirty with what i'm working on you know i can just throw that in a container so i might as well have a read-only root file system and a read-only desktop in essence and just have the applications being provided by containers of some kind um, beyond the lazy developer use case, you know, it should also apply, like talked about, you know, your typical kind of Chromebook or iOS or Android user, where they're used to having an operating system that is very, very static, that updates itself, has automated updates, has automatic rollbacks. You know, and the thing they care about is the apps from the App Store. Well, we've got tools for handling apps like an App Store now. So I can see things going down that road rather nicely. So the goal of the micro desktop is a little bit different from the rest of micro OS. You know, it's still going to be reliable, predictable, and immutable, just like micro OS. Um, it's definitely going to be like less customizable than your traditional tumbleweed or leap installation. Um, even with contributors, like we really welcome contributors to this project. Don't get me wrong. Um, but there are times when some new contributor swoops in and like says, you know, oh, I want to add this and this and this to the micro OS desktop. And I'm like, yeah, do we need any of that stuff? Really? Like the, we don't necessarily need to have it to have all the bells and whistles, Tumbleweed and Leap take care of that. You know, we want to have a sort of less customizable and more curated experience for those users. Um, and as part of that, you know, it should be small, um, but not necessarily small at the cost of functionality. So, you know, things like printing, gaming, media production all need to be there and work. They quite often have drivers or subsystems, things like cups need to be installed. Um, so we, we're, you know, we're not ever just going to say no for the sake of saying no to keep it small, but at the same time, we only want to make sure that if we're adding something, it's kind of in, yeah, in the attempt to solve this problem that micro SD desktop is trying to solve, and the whole experience should work really nicely out of the box. Judging the micro SD desktop as it stands today, we've got those images. They're reliable. They're predictable. They're mutable, just like the rest of micro OS. It's definitely less customizable than, than the regular Tumbleweed and Leap. It's small. Um, and yeah, it's actually almost, this almost should be a tick box actually. But yeah, it's small, but sometimes a little bit too small at the moment. There are some functionality for things like gaming drivers or multimedia that aren't quite as smooth out of the box as I'd like. And generally speaking, micro OS desktop isn't as smooth out of the box as we would like it to be. Um, we really would like more people to help us look at it figure out the packages and the like that are missing. We've sort of trimmed it so tight that it's sometimes a little bit yeah, too small now. And just help us kind of get that configuration done so things just work right out of the box. One example of that is things like when packages are missing, um, you know, where would the best place be to actually pull the fix from? You know, if we have it packaged in OpenSUSE, our tendency has typically been, okay, we'll just pull it from the typical Tumbleweed repository and we're done. But if we're starting to get to the point now where Flatpak has some of this functionality, some of these packages already packaged up, um, and we kind of like the idea of the micro SD desktop pulling Flatpaks by default, but I have to be honest, which is why I'm mentioning it at Fostem, I don't actually know how to install those Flatpaks by default. So if anybody has any ideas or suggestions, please reach out to me, let me know, because I love that kind of, I think will be the sort of last bit to really get the micro SD desktop out of alpha and into sort of beta and regular usage for everybody. If you'd like to reach out to contribute to us, um, the micro SD project all kind of originally spawned as a, a sub project out of Cubic. Um, it's kind of funny now, so Cubic is a sub project, but um, yeah, so the best mailing list to reach find us all in is the OpenSUSE Cubic mailing list or Cubic on IRC on Freenode. Or if you just want to submit something, you know, you can basically send anything to factory and, you know, we'll probably find it at some point. Or if you don't already have a develop project in the OpenSUSE process, then going to the Devel Cubic Devel project is where we will take OpenSUSE build service requests, help curate it before we get it into the main distributions.
And with that, I am done. So if there's any questions, um, please fire away and I'll do my best to ask them, answer them. Thank you very much.